Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. The latest on DirecTV and Disney still struggling to reach a deal. Millions of subscribers were blacked out of ESPN's Monday Night Football featuring the New York Jets and San Francisco 49ers. The dispute highlighting the shifting power balance in sports and TV. Steve Maliuka of Bain Capital and co-owner of the Boston Celtics and Atalanta Football Club joins us now for more. Steve, it's good to see you, sir. Thanks Great for joining us. Thank you for being here. Let's talk about this standoff. What do you make of this current standoff at the moment between DirecTV and Disney? Well, this is a, in, a, in a long series of kind of the war in media right now, the, the old media versus the new media, and distributors versus content providers. And we've seen this before. I was involved directly with uh, the Weather Channel that had a big battle, you know, long fought battle with, with DirecTV as well. And, uh, you know, content providers want the appropriate uh, money for their content, and, but the distributors are between a rock and a hard place because the distributors, they don't have content and they want to maximize the price they can get. So that's what you're seeing now. What do you think the future of sports distribution is, which is a highly broad question, I know, but what do you think the future is? Well, I think, I think the, the, the future is good because sports is the most watched programs. I, I think 93 of the top, top 100 programs in the USA last year were sports events. And, uh, and, so, and so you have to have sports events if you're a d- distributor to get, get eyeballs. Do you see a future where they skip the traditional distributors and these sports franchises just stream directly themselves? Is that the direction of travel for you or is that too well, complicated? Well, it's, it's a great question. It's going to be a battle between convenience and bundling you know, versus trying to get a la carte anything that you want to watch. So we'll have to watch that over the next 10 years. The good news is that the content providers like the NBA are in good shape no matter which way it goes because because content, as, as I think Eisner said a long time ago, content is king. Well, just to sort of push that a little further, there's this issue, and I see this with my sons as they digest sports and they have access to some and not access to others. And do you rather have a generation that is brought up with easily accessible sports and being able to tune in and the popularity increases or would you rather hire fees from specific uh, streaming sites? Well, that's the balancing act, and I think you want both because you obviously won't have new fans unless you have broader distribution. If, if the charges are high, you're going to really you know, shut off your fan universe to the fanatic fans. So uh, you're seeing many deals now where people go on air TV you know, plus, plus a distribution channel. So it's kind of like the movies promote things going you know, onto cable or, or, or going onto, onto satellite. Um, and so you're going to have to have a balance of both. The international sports scene. I guess that there's a question about uh, the U.S. and how sort of isolated it is. We've seen an increasing sort of internationalization with with respect to soccer or football, with respect to basketball, or with respect to even uh, baseball. How much do you see that continuing, even with some of the direct streaming, et cetera, some of the new agreements that are coming out? Well, direct streaming is actually going to increase that because now you can access any sports from anywhere at any time. And uh, if you think about, you know, the NBA audience, the global sports like football and basketball, uh, huge international market. Things are blending together. I think 30% of the players in the NBA are from, are from foreign markets, and people want to see those players. So we're only the tip of the iceberg, and that's going to grow dramatically over the next 20 years. Can we see more sports teams do what the Yankees did, say, with the Yes Network? You know, that, that, that will help defend, uh, you know, creating kind of regional ESPNs. So that's a compelling reason. If, if, for example, you're in New York and you want to see all the New York teams, that's probably a defensible moat that you can have a cable business. But, 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 but uh, not having that and people being able to go direct is a real problem. So how hard is that if you're not, say, the Yankees or the Boston Celtics, if you're the smaller team trying to break in? Yeah, it's, it's a little more difficult, but, but on, on the other side of it, the smaller teams have really profited by the fact you have so much social media and clips and accessibility. So it used to be to be a star, you'd have to be in New York or Boston or L.A. You can be a star anywhere right now because people can, can, can talk with you directly, uh, see your market yourself, see the small team. So, 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 so the small teams are actually on the rise. You've got a footprint into major markets. You've got a footprint over in Europe, in European football, and here in the NBA, here in America. How different are things in the European market versus, say, the US one when it comes to sports TV distribution? There, there's some similarities, but they're, they're, they're different in, in the fact that you have you know, different countries, you have leagues coming together, and, and certainly in football, it's very confusing. It's hard to understand in America that you're playing in kind of three different leagues at the same time. You've got your, your Italian national team players that leave your team for a while and go to that team. You have the Champions League, the Europa League, and then you have each nation has a league of its own. 
So, so you, you have to be a very facile fan to understand what you're playing for and these different cups and things. And the U.S. is, is much, much simple. The, the league is, is, is very simple. Uh, you're going for a championship, and that's it. There's one championship. In Europe, there's championship cups and Europa Cups and all sorts of things. The Europeans might say that's a feature and not a bug. It's part of the beauty of European football. I think it is. I think it is. It, 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 and look, the NBA has, has really learned from that. And we have the in-season tournament, and many people were skeptics. You know, Adam Silver was very courageous in pushing that through. That had amazing ratings last year. Um, the, the, the games were early in the season. It made it be like late season. So it's been a big success. So I would extend that thought and say the Europeans might think it's a feature and not a bug. I wonder if certain people think it's a bug and not a feature, given that it might actually prevent them from being able to really unlock franchise value. One thing that I've noticed, without a doubt, Football is the biggest sport on the planet. But when you get a list of the biggest franchises by value, top 10, it is dominated by American sports teams. Why are Americans and American sports teams so much better at unlocking franchise value versus their European counterparts? Well, that's a great question, John. And I think Europe's got to, got to start to, to go more towards the American model. Um, the American model basically has a very strong central control of the league, so the league can negotiate the television deals. It's all unified. You can have a, a unified cost structure. It's been much more difficult. Soccer kind of grew up from, from the, uh, the, the minor leagues to the major leagues. It's a very different system. And, and so you have a hard time unifying it because it's in different countries. So that's the advantage of being in a large footprint like the United States, where there's one approach. And you can have a strong commissioner and really smart commissioner like Adam Silver really map out how do we get the product to most people at the most effective cost to get the most eyeballs on it. In Europe, it's very fragmented right now. What would private equity bring to the U.S. sphere? Uh, particularly, I'm talking about football, the idea of private equity investment. There are many now that are looking at it now that the potential for a 10% ownership is available. Well, I, I think, I think it, you know, it's a misnomer to call it private equity, uh, classic private equity, because private equity really... Uh, comes in, buys a company, tries to grow a company, uh, build a strategic plan, globalize a company. A 10% investment in an NBA team is more like investing in, in gold, or maybe, not Bitcoin because it's volatile, but it's more like gold. It's, 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 <laughs> value, its value has never gone down in the last 25 years. Um, it's, it's been a, you know, a, a, a double-digit returner for 25 years. So Specific funds will be raised and are raised, funds like Arctos and Dial, they are raised to be put into these clubs. And if someone wants a safe investment and to participate in the NBA in their own way, they can go to these funds. But that's not really classic private equity. So the, the stir in the newspapers of private equity is taking over football teams, it's going to call the plays. That's not happening. It's a 10% it's a passive stake in what is a fantastic asset. You know, the NFL has, again, grown for 25 years, all the values, and it allows people to invest that's non-correlated to the market. So that's how it's sold. It's really specific sports-related media funds. How fantastic are these investments if we were to see a 28% uh, capital gains tax? Well, uh, the, the, it, it, that's going to apply to everything, so it's all on a relative basis. So on a relative basis, it, it'll, it'll be the same. Um, you know, I, I think inevitably taxes will go up given the deficits that we have and probably should go up and hopefully do it in a thoughtful way so it doesn't uh, you know, kill the economy. What is a thoughtful way as a businessman? Well, if you look at, if you look at nations that have uh, a, a total tax that's the same on capital gains as, as it is on ordinary income, you'll find that they rank much lower in terms of venture capital you know, business formation. The United States is number one in that, and it has contributed to the fact that you know, if you invest in venture capital and you, and you go for the long term and you have capital gains, a whole industry has been created around that. Europe's behind in that, China's behind in that, and, and it's not perfect, but, but some asymmetry between those rates helps that industry grow and then helps companies grow. Do you see some contradictions in the democratic platform that they seem to want to foster startup culture and at the same time there is this constant, and I would say constant effort to think of the best way to tax unrealized gains? Is that a high contradiction from your standpoint? Well, you know, I, I think as you guys know, John, I, I think I see contradictions in politics on all sides. <laughs> um, and I think we're in a very rough period right now. We're in a very rough period where things have become polarized. You know, you know, populism has taken over. And I hope we'll get back to some rationality where both sides can sit down and say, okay, what is a relevant tax policy that we can uh, fill the deficit but not kill the economy? And let's compromise and get something in the middle. And hopefully that's where we're going. I think we all share that hope. Steve, it's good to see you. Thanks it's for sharing your thoughts here. this morning. Thank you, sir. Steve Paliuka of Bain Capital.